Good day, everybody. Welcome back to the channel. Well, do you remember some time ago when I said that I was downsizing my typewriter collection? All of a sudden, something weird happened uh, Sunday, I think it was. That's right. This happened. Stay tuned. This is branded as a Singer Electric. And it is a Smith Chrono, specifically an SCM Smith Chrono Marchant 6 Series from the 1960s. Type R Electric. Standard width carriage, manual carriage return. The speed of an electric Type R machine in the colors of the Dream Sickle. Not really orange, more yellowish, but pretty close. Or is it lemon meringue pie? Hmm. Well, if I was cutting down my collection in size and all of a sudden got this, why? Why this one? Well, first of all, it's a Type Bar Electric, and I have kind of fallen for these machines uh, lately. I find them to be the fastest plus most economical use machines, typewriters. Fastest meaning they're just as fast as any other electronic or electric typewriter. I really think they're probably faster than a daisy wheel typewriter only because they don't have that electronic delay that some of the daisy wheel typewriters have because they're electromechanical. And I can type just as fast on this as I could on an IBM Selectric, I think. And they're the most economical because they use cloth ribbons instead of one-time use only carbon film ribbons. It's a standard width carriage, which I really like, a little more compact in size. It has the manual carriage return instead of the very powerful, almost too energetic powered carriage return. And being a Smith Corona, they're reliable and easy to service. And also, you don't really find, at least I don't, find good type bar electrics that often. I've worked on this uh, mostly yesterday evening and this morning cleaned it up, had it apart several times, and I've done a few upgrades to it. Uh, one of the upgrades was the original power cord was black, as most of them were, and it had a splice in it, like an electrical tape splice. And so I decided that I needed to find a new power cord and not just any power cord. So this is what I did to replace the power cord. The original power cord to this typewriter, at least the original one it came with when I bought it, <laughs> is about seven feet long. It's pretty flexible, right? It's not real stiff, but it has at least one splice in it. And I wanted to replace the cord. So I started thinking, well, I, I need to go get an extension cord that I can use for a power cord. What kind of cord shall I get? And then I started thinking, looking at the color scheme of the typewriter, look at this. I got a cloth power cord, kind of a gold and white, cream colored. I think it'll match really well with the typewriter. This is an eight foot cord. I think the original one, or at least the, the one it came with, was about seven feet, so it should work pretty well. Um, this new cord does have the flat style plug, and I'm hoping that won't be a problem. Okay, the first thing is make sure the power cord is unplugged. And we're going to be taking off this screw. Yeah, and there's a nasty cut on my finger. And this screw right here. And then you might have to pry the bottom plate off around the edge of the foot. And don't lose the screws if you can avoid it. So then this guy kind of pries around the rubber foot on both sides. Ta -da! And right down here is the electrical connection. Okay, so um, the original connections used these wire nuts. The wires were twisted on, and then they just had some kind of a masking tape covering them. Um, so I use the same nuts, but you have to be careful about the ribbon advanced gears here, this uh, shaft with these gears. And these wire nuts can get really close to rubbing against them. There's also a little spring contact here for the ribbon advance. So I kind of tie wrap things out of the way just to keep those uh, wire nuts uh, secure. There's also a strain relief here that the plug goes through. And I don't know if my cloth power cord is going to be too big for this strain relief. So we may have to just do a ad hoc strain relief. All right, so I'm just going to cut this tie wrap that I put in to keep it out of the way. The other thing I do is I put these 
tie wraps around the base of both wires at the base of the wire nut just to keep them together if in case there's any stress that might want to pull the wires apart and then uh, let's go ahead and uh, disconnect these and we will take off this strain relief okay let's just try it ah, yes okay we're gonna have to cut this back separate out this cloth looks like a synthetic cloth so we might be able to singe it with a, a lighter and try to get it to fuse together and not unravel okay just verifying the ribbed wire goes to neutral which should be the flat the fat terminal let's see here and it does all right let's see if I can split this a little bit yeah, I could be using a fancier wire stripper, but these old wire strippers are kind of cool because they're so small, they fit in the toolbox so nicely. Okay, let's see about running. I don't know if the strain relief that I have is going to work for this wire because the it's pretty fat. I may have to just tie wrap, use tie wraps as a strain relief. Okay, both of these, I think I'm going to cut this a wee bit shorter here. Make sure nice and tight. Get the wire nut on there good. So I'm going to try to secure these two in case the wire nut pops out or in case there's some kind of stress on there, you know, mechanical stress pulling on it. It'll at least keep the two wires together, hopefully like that nice and tight nice and tight so I can get this apart like that okay I don't think this is uh, narrower enough to use this particular strain relief it looks like the wire is too fat to fit in it and I don't have a larger one so I'm just going to tie wrap this put the nut of the tie wrap on the inside so it doesn't become a problem so like that now the other part I have is these wire nuts um, I'd like to wire them out of the way of the ribbon advance mechanism you have the rubber feet that actually raises it up let's plug this in and hey she runs and I got the frayed ends of this nylon sleeve melted down so they're not gonna hopefully get all frayed out and loose so the aesthetics of a cloth covered power cord well when these were brand new, obviously they were not cloth covered cords. They were plasticky cords like uh, most typewriters are. But you know, there's a lot of these retro style cords now out on the market. This was an extension cord. And I thought, you know what? If you're gonna have an electric typewriter that has a power cord, and if the power cord is one of those parts of electric typewriters that most people don't really appreciate the aesthetics of very well, you know, why not have a nice looking power cord at least, right? This was the closest I could find at my local, um, I went to Target, my local area that matches pretty close to the color scheme, right? It's sort of a gold and cream colored cord. This is pretty close to that color wise. Um, I'm not super excited about the flat style plug, but it works fine. And as far as the lack of a proper strain relief through the bottom hole, I will be getting a proper strain relief. It's just the one that I was using was uh, for a smaller size gauge cord. So if you do a replacement power cord, I would definitely advise you use the proper strain relief because you don't want the insulation on the cord chafing on that metal hole in the bottom of the, of the machine and eventually cutting through. You could have a real serious safety issue. So use the proper strain relief. And you saw how I used some cable ties, so-called tie wraps, to tie wrap those wire nets out of the way. And I also tie wrap the pairs of wires at the base of the wire nut so they won't pull loose. It relieves the strain on the wire nut itself. 
I did think about using bullet connectors or even soldering the wires together with heat shrink, but I kind of like the idea with uh, wire nuts. Um, you can disconnect it a little bit easier if you have to or whatever. Um, okay, so that wasn't the only upgrade. Um, after I did all the cleaning and degreasing to it, um, I noticed, of course, it was making kind of an irritating sound as it was running, and I pretty soon was able to isolate that to the belts. It had the original square cross-section belts, and I went ahead and took the machine apart again to gain access to the belts, took them off, and I could see that one of them was definitely deformed, like it had been sitting around the small diameter motor pulley for years and years, and that primary belt also had a, a split in it that was going to be tearing out, and I think that was the cause of the noise it was making. It's definitely quieter now that I have new belts on, and instead of using a uh, square cross-section belts, I used the quick expediency of going to the local hardware store and getting one eighth inch diameter round cross-section synthetic rubber belts. These are plumbing O-rings. The two that I used in this were three and seven eighths inches, so just under a four inch diameter inside diameter belt, and it seems to work fine. Okay, well, so there's two drive belts on these systems, and if you look at the primary drive belt coming from the motor, there is a little split starting to happen right here. It does work, uh, although it makes a little bit of noise. This is probably a good opportunity to take the unit apart, show you how to do that, see if we can change these belts out. Okay, so on the bottom, we've taken the uh, bottom panel off. We're gonna take off these four screws here, 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 and here. Next, behind the ribbon cover on the side of the carriage, we're going to take off this screw and this bracket and the equivalent one on the other side as well. And I mark the two brackets left and right, and I have the screws captive underneath the piece of tape just to make it a little bit easier for me to find them later. Okay, the next thing we're going to take off are the screws underneath the lid itself, the two here and here that connect to these brackets that are going to flip backwards. There's a little locating pin on the bracket in the corner that goes through the hole there. So we'll take those out. And when you take those two screws off, the top panel kind of will fall backwards. And it runs in a slotted track on both the left and the right side. And if you angle the track just right or angle the corner of it you can kind of remove the bracket in the slot that runs in there's a wide hole in the very front of that slot that this pin runs in and you can just pull out the whole lid in one piece like that okay the spring-loaded arm that opens and closes the lid just folds back like this just be careful of these two little brackets here. They're going to want to hit the ribbons. Um, next thing to do is to loosen these screws holding the two sides of the plastic front bezel, the keyboard bezel. You don't have to remove these screws. You just loosen them. That should pop right off like this. Now, this one you see right there, there's a broken piece of yellow plastic. This one on the right side was already broken earlier, but just be careful with it, it is fragile. It's a little tricky, you have to basically pick up the back of the carriage, and you have to work the keyboard area out from between this wire spring-loaded frame. Like that. Well, okay, so let's take the one belt off. By the way, this center pulley is controlled by the impression adjustment. It basically spring loads this bracket. It sort of pulls on the main belt at different tensions. Anyways, we'll just pop this guy off. Just keep track of which one is which. Now you notice there's a built-in uh, bend to this belt. It's been sitting for years uh, without running and so that might be part of the wobbling sound it's making, is the fact the belt isn't perfectly round. And then this one here, the primary one, has there's like a split starting here, and then this right here is getting to the point where it's almost breaking. So let's see if I have a 
plumbing o-ring of the right size. I got three and three quarters and four inch. So these are both three and uh, three and seven eighths, I should say, three and seven eighths. Well, it looks like it's uh, humming along. And it seems a little quieter. Let me thread a piece of paper in here. Let's see what happens here. Nice. Well, it looks like a three and seven eighths inch round, eighth inch thick plumbing O-ring works fine. So now, cleaned up and in its case, I think the new power cord sits pretty well on the left side of the machine, although this little flat plug is kind of irritating because it's a little bit too wide and diagonal looking to fit in the little gap down here in the corner. So what I've done is I've ran it underneath the gap between the back of the ribbon cover and the carriage, I, but I don't want to get it into the ribbon itself because then you'll start getting inky smears on this cloth, but that's probably about the best place to put it right now until I figure out something else. And the case also, the hinges and all that needed to be cleaned. Well, this is very much a 6 Series Smith Corona. We'll start at the left side of the carriage. Of course, you have your carriage return lever, and this is uh, the kind that does not have the plastic padding on the, the the handle of the return lever but just just a cast metal um, you have your paper bale with rubber paper bale rollers and the rollers actually are in fairly good shape they're not split they're a little hard of course here is the uh, racing table right here that has uh, we'll show you on the other side the electric logo you have your um, one two and three line spacing selector like a standard six series smith corona would this is the line spacing uh, release for doing uh, continuous uh, uh, line adjustment. And then the uh, carriage knob itself, and the middle button releases the line spacing clutch for permanent adjustments to the line spacing selector. And here is the left hand carriage release lever. These are known to be a little bit delicate. Uh, they do break on some machines, but I've had good luck with the 6 Series machines that I have owned. On the left side is also the end of page indicator that Smith Corona is known for. We have the standard margin settings, press and slide, the Singer logo, yes, yeah, Singer, and the rabbit ear style paper support. On the right side of the carriage, we have the right hand paper bill roller. We have the paper release itself for releasing the pressure rollers, the right hand margin adjustment, the right hand carriage release lever, and lift this up. What you have in here is the release lever for taking out the platen. So this has the quick disconnect platen feature like uh, a lot of the other typewriters do in the Smith Corona lineup. So you can take the platen right out like that. So that's going to be handy if I decide to get the, this platen resurfaced by J.J. Short. And then, of course, down on the bottom here, underneath the right side, you have the centering lever for the carriage. This is not a true a mechanical lock of the carriage. It just centers it in the middle, and you really have to rely upon the case to keep it from moving back and forth when you're transporting it. And if you're observant, you will notice that our paper scale goes to about 83 on the scale. So this is a pica size typeface on a standard width carriage. And I really like this electric logo. This is a Singer kind of styling, but it has this power cord coming out from the E, from the middle of the E of electric. It's kind of a cool logo. I really like it. There are some condition issues, as you would expect a typewriter of this vintage. There's some scratches up here in the middle between the uh, margin settings. And there's a few spots of paint that are uh, chipped away on the ribbon cover, noticeably uh, probably by the carriage return lever, and a few light scratches in the paint, but not too bad. Like almost all the 6 Series Smith Coronas, it has the articulating ribbon cover that pulls forward. 
revealing the ribbon vibrator area. It has these short little plastic card guides with the little holes for drawing lines, your sets of red lines in the clear card guide for lining up your type, and a standard uh, for the 6 Series uh, quick ribbon loading system, these spring-loaded little arms that you can easily put the ribbon into. And it has the standard reversing mechanism of these Smith Coronas as well. Uses standard half-inch cloth ribbons. I'm sporting metal spools. Yay for me. And uh, I think the type slugs are really surprisingly clean on this machine, considering its age. Looks like it hadn't had a lot of use in a long time. So the keyboard is a standard electric style uh, modern keyboard. You have your big tabulator bar in the middle up here your tab clear, tab set button. You have your standard one through zero plus dash and plus equals and the number one key is also a changeable type, key cap and slug. Ribbon reverse, there is a manual ribbon reverse lever in the upper left corner here. Manual backspacer. Shift and shift lock, which it is a it is power shifting. It is powered by the uh, motor drive spindle, and then this uh, adjustment right here is copy set. And what this adjusts, it adjusts the tension on the intermediate idler pulley, which basically determines how hard the primary belt is tensioned against the motor pulley, which in turn affects how hard the type slugs hit the paper. So it adjusts between 1 and 10. I don't think these numbers are necessarily indicative of how many copies you can make per se, but it does affect the force of how it hits. There's a little bit of uh, scarring and scuffing on the two front corners of the body here and over here. Not too bad, considering its age. A nice big standard size space bar, and all your keys, a standard American style keyboard. Over here in the upper right is the margin release, and this is your ribbon bichrome setting, and it does have the intermediate uh, stencil position. And the power switch right here. And down here below the space bar is this little decal. It informs you of where the touch selector is. Here is the touch selector knob itself right here. And as you turn that, there's a little indicator needle that moves, indicating between 1 to 4 in terms of touch as a reference number. And I've always been impressed with the hardy rubber feet on these Smith Coronas, the 6 Series. They really do sit well on the table without needing a typing pad. They just don't slide around that much. And I seem to think that they uh, age pretty well. I haven't seen these too badly cracked or really hardened too much. And I really think this key is the most significant key on an electric type bar machine. It's lowercase apostrophe, two keys to the right of the L, means you can do contractions without having to first shift. You remember older manual keyboards typically had the apostrophe as a shifted eight. I really like the idea that if you're a modern writer and you're writing dialogue in some story, you can capture the modern idioms of speech using the way people talk with contractions. You have to use apostrophes, and it just makes it so much nicer to quickly do an apostrophe and move on. And it, It's just so important, I think. I think that plus the ease of the touch it just makes it so nice to be able to operate. It's essentially every bit as good as a computer keyboard in the sense of a very short travel and very little force required to operate it. Well, let's turn it on, shall we? I got some 32 pound laser paper. It might be a little thick for this. Paper seems to feed pretty nicely in this machine though. And with this new ribbon I put in, it has a really nice dark imprint. It has a really good type alignment and that yummy imprint. Alignment between upper and lower case is really good. So I have the uh, touch adjustment set to the lowest setting. Let's see how far I can push it before it trips. Now let me set it to the highest setting. Just a little farther. It's really fraction of a centimeter, maybe five millimeters or so. 
I think it's important that we discuss the downside or potential downsides to type bar electric machines. Well, first of all, there is the constant sound of the motor. That may or may not be a problem for you. This particular typewriter is not too bad, especially now that I've replaced the drive belts. But that could be an issue, or you might find this, the background hum of the motor might just be a comforting thing that might help you write, I don't know. The other thing is the impact or force of the keys uh, on the platen is rather loud. It's louder than some manual typewriters, perhaps not as loud as others, keeping in mind that this machine has a hard platen and it needs to be resurfaced with fresh rubber, which I'll probably do at one point. But that can be an issue, and I would advise in this case probably to use a backing sheet of construction paper in the meantime. And then, of course, you have a power cord. Even though it is a pretty cloth-covered power cord, you still have a power cord, and you have to consider the fact that um, it has a case, you can carry it around, but it's gonna need to be plugged in, obviously, just like many laptop computers would be. So those are maybe the three potential downsides of a Type R electric, keeping in mind that what you're getting for these potential downsides is blazingly fast typing speed, extremely easy soft keys to strike, and the imprint quality is independent of your finger force, and it is a very nice dark imprint. And you also have the repeat key functions I should mention. You have the X, the period, the dash, and the spacebar are all repeat keys. And so if you do a lot of strike throughs, that is a good thing. So if you're interested in a machine like this, who is this machine for or what is the best use case? Well, I think the best use case is like extended writing sessions, what I would call serious writing where you don't want any fatigue in your hands and fingers. And I would also say people with ergonomic or cumulative traumatic disorder issues or arthritis, like I have a little bit in my thumbs, these kind of machines are really ideal for those situations. But I think these are serious writing machines. And I especially like the idea of a compact standard carriage, manual carriage return kind of typewriter. It gives you a sense of a manual typewriter, but it has the blazingly fast typing speed of an electric. As far as their aesthetics, not everybody likes the 6 Series by Smith Corona as far as the looks. I have a two-tone blue Galaxy 12. It's kind of a pretty machine. This one here, I was originally thinking I would call it the Dreamsicle, but it's really not really orange. It's more yellowish, so I guess it's going to be the Lemon Meringue Pie, which is not a good name at all. So if you guys have any ideas for what the name of this typewriter should be, Sunflower? No, that's not right. Um, anyways, it doesn't have to have a name, obviously, right? So you may not like the aesthetics of these machines. I actually think this yellow uh, cream color two-tone is pretty nice, actually. Um, it's kind of growing on me. Well, this is it. Um, my latest typewriter in my collection that was not supposed to be getting any bigger. But if there's any consolation, my recent um, Hermes 10 Type R Electric, remember that's my family typewriter, it's now back with my oldest brother. And so I made room <laughs> by getting that out of the house for this. So there you go. And this is a little bit smaller of a typewriter, obviously. Well, there you go. A Singer brand Smith Corona 6 Series Type R Electric. I really like this one. How about you guys? Are you interested in Type R Electrics? Drop a note down below. We'd love to have a dialogue with you. And until next time, you stay well. Have yourselves a great day. Bye-bye for now.